Okay, so here I am in the library. Thought I would do something different today. I have uh, Mr. James Rickard's book here, The Road to Ruin, The Global Elite's Secret Plan for the Next Global Financial Crisis, rather. So I want to take a minute to just thumb through the book before I actually purchase it, if I end up purchasing it. But I wanted to take a minute, go through it, do something different, something more of the line of a book review, just to make sure it's something I want to purchase, being that I've purchased his books prior to. So I thought I would take you along with me just to give you an inside look as to what the book looks like before I actually purchase it. So it's quite you know thick in nature. I think it's about, uh, let me see, 300 or so pages full of, you know, a lot of interesting content here. So what I'm gonna do basically is just scroll through the book here, read some of the things here, and just, you know, let you see what's going on in here if you haven't purchased the book yet and may be interested in purchasing it. So just to give an idea of what's going on here. You know, you got the cover here, burning, you know, $100 bills, walking into a burning bush, pretty much painting a very bad picture for, you know, the future of the Federal Reserve note. But anyway, it starts off here. Deep in the U.S. legal code, our government has granted emergency economic power. Stock exchange can be closed. ATM shut down. Money markets frozen. The global elites know that the crisis of even greater proportions is coming, and that collaboration is the only way to survive. Since 2014, international monetary agencies have been issuing warnings to a small group of finance ministers, sovereign wealth funds, banks, private equity funds, yada, yada, yada. In preparation, the global elites have been noisily hoarding cash and hard assets over the past two years. New York Times bestselling author James Rickards sounds the alarm on currency manipulation and currency wars, yada, yada, yada. So there's a couple of other books here. So let's get into the hard meat of this book here briefly. Um, here we have here, scrolling through, scrolling through. Revelation 656. When he had opened the third seal, I heard a third living creature crying out, Come forward. And I beheld a black horse, and his rider held a scale in his hand. I heard a voice in the midst of four living creatures, I said, A measure of wheat cost a day's pay, and three measures of barley cost a day's pay, but do not damage the oil and wine. Interesting, not quite sure what that is for. But anyway, so here we have the contents. Introduction, chapter one. This is the end. Chapter two, one money, one world. Uh, chapter three, desert city of mind. Chapter four, four shock, 1998. Chapter five, four shock, 2008. Earthquake, chapter six, 2018. So it looks like 2018 is the time frame that he has things coming to an end. Chapter 7, Bonfires of the Elite. Chapter 8, Capitalism, Fascism, and Democracy. Chapter 9, Behold a Black Horse. So I take it he's going to get into what he was talking about with that quote in the beginning. So what I'll do is run through a couple of chapters, you know, call out some things that may be of interest or things that jumps out right away and let you see it for yourself. But just scrolling through, looking for any graphs or anything like that. I see a little formula here. What else we got going on here? Yeah, that was pretty simple there. Chapter one, this is the end of the conversation. Uh, okay, here 401, Black Ross, five trillion of assets were spread across equities, fixed commodities, foreign exchange, derivatives in black markets, five continents, okay. Obama administration raised the art of political prosecution to the heights not seen since 1934. Interesting, interesting. Okay, here we have Ice Nine. So I've heard and watched a couple of his videos prior to, and I've heard a lot about the Ice Nine. And just to look into it a little deeper, it says 1963, dark comedic novel, Cat's Cradle, author Kurt Von Nuckelt, uh created a substance he called Ice Nine, and discovered by his physicist Dr. Felix Honecker. Ice Nine had two properties that distinguished it from regular water. The first was melting pot of 114 and 4 degrees, which meant Ice Nine was frozen at room temperature. Honecker placed some Ice Nine molecules in sealed vials and gave them to the kitchen before children before he went to before he died. The novel's plot turns on the fact that it is Ice Nine is revealed, released from the vials, and put in contact with a large body of water. The entire water supply on Earth, rivers, lakes, and oceans would free. Wow, interesting. Ice Nine fits with an understanding of financial markets as complex dynamic systems. An Ice Nine molecule does not freeze an entire ocean instantaneously. It freezes only adjacent molecules. Financial panic spread the same way. In the classic 1930s version, they began with a run on a small town bank. The panic spread until it hit Wall Street and starts a shop stock market crash. In the 21st century version, panic start in a computer algorithm. 
which triggers pre-programmed sale orders that cascade into other computers until the system spins out of control. Interesting. So he's uh, kind of explaining the whole ICE-9 concept. So the cascade of selling happened on October 19th, 1987, when the Dow Jones Industrial Average fell 22% in one day, equivalent to 4,000 point drop in index today. Interesting. Talks about Cyprus here. The whole bank situation happened in Cyprus. Okay, so let me throw a scroll to this thing a little bit faster and see what else jumps out. We got house closed. Panic of 1907 originated in San Francisco earthquake and fire of 18 April 18, 1902. Western Insurance Company sold assets to pay claims. So it goes back a little bit into time, giving some historical accounts of things that kind of leads up to the day. Then we have the money riots. It says the period from 1971 to 1980 in international finance is best described as chaotic, not only in clinical sense, but in a scientific sense. All right. So yeah, so I'm gonna scroll through this thing a little faster. Pull out just some subtitles. We got chapter two, one money, one world, one order. So I guess he's gonna definitely hint at that SDR. So we have one uh, world money. World money is not a new concept that has been used throughout history. World money is gold. The elite agenda is to hoard gold and substitute special drawing rights as the currency of world trade and finance. Other forms of money, including clamshells, feathers, paper, have been used at certain times and places with tribal consent or force of law. Renaissance bankers realized they could put the gold in their custody to use their including loans. So it goes back a little bit to banking history. Interesting, interesting, interesting. Keep it going, keep it going, keep it going. So, so far I'm gonna pay 68 out of 350. So I'm trying to skim through this thing faster and see what jumps out. And we have world taxation. It says for a decade at the start of my career, I was international tax counsel to Citibank and then the world's most powerful private bank. Citibank had branches in more countries than US foreign service and bad embassies. But we mastered the art of paying no tax, but paying some tax was a challenge. There were many levers at the disposal. We used foreign tax and exchange insurance. Okay. So I'll take it as uh, he's going to talk more detail about a world tax uh, that will go along with uh, that global SDR dollar. Then we have world order. The new world order is not new. Civilizations have devised from forms of the world over the millennia because the alternative to order is chaos. Order really includes liberty of justice, orderly main ends, world order. Interesting, get some more into that. The Shock Doctrine. Naomi claims 2007 book, The Shock Doctrine popularized the technique at least used to advance hidden agendas. Elite formulas, plans for the world order they wish to see, they wait for exogenous shock a natural disaster or financial crisis and use fear created by shock to advance their vision. New policy is presented and to mitigate the fear, the policy is a way to advance the plan for world order. The idea is simple, yet applying shock doctrine involves decades of persistent effort. Shocks come randomly and elite plan never goes away. Interesting shock doctrine. Chapter three, Desert City of Mind. No keys unlocks the mysteries of capital markets with more. Los Alamos. Not sure what that is. Capital and complexity. Then we have his formula here for that complex of, um, what is what I say here? Com uh, capital and complex. Complexity theory, which, let me see, Bayes' theorem is a simplified mathematical modern form states where PA is the probability of observant event A without regard to event B. P B, yeah, that's something that's gonna require some definite studying into quite complicated just from trying to read it but i'm sure it makes sense in the overall scheme of things here here we have a couple here are some events here that says call those that uh form confirm the shanghai accord heads and those that refuse the shanghai accord tales february 26 2016 before the g20 meeting is quite over fed governor leo bernard gives a speech in new york saying it's a natural is it natural to consider with their coordination can improve outcomes? Da, da, da. February 27th, and in conclusion of the Shanghai G20 meeting, U.S. Treasury Secretary Jack Lew says, we'll keep each other informed. So it looks like he's going through some chain of events that are playing right into his whole complexity model, if I might say here. All right, so feedback. 
There we go. Keep it moving. Let me see if anything else is worth. Oh, okay, chapter four, the four shock, 1998, the money machine, 2008 financial crisis inspired a legion of books and movies, including a uh, uh, memorable narrative, Too Big to Fail. By all accounts, the financial system suffered a heart attack that year. The medical metaphor is not a stretch. The four financial system really did have a heart attack and patient nearly died. What struck me the most about 2008 was I seen it, I seen this movie before. So he goes into, I'm sure explain about, um, he talks about the LTCM that he was a part of. It almost brought, you know, everything down back in, back in, was it early 90s or something like that. So he goes on, experts, who else we got here? LTCM, 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 LTCM. So it talks a lot about that long-term capital mortgage or whatever it's called, LTCM, LTCM. So it actually, you know, probably gives a lot more insight to that. Avarice, what else we got here? Vortex. Do, 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 do. Lessons not learned. The lessons of LTCM's rescue were clear. Derivative density and uh, patency uh, meant yeah, neither regulators nor banks knew where risk lay. Derivatives allowed massive leverage because of the collateral required was minute, minute relative to the growth value. Do, do. Talks about Goldman goes bankrupt. What happens if Goldman goes bankrupt? So the city banks, one billion hedge position is gross long. Gives them some scenarios there. What can happen? More complexity theorem, the aftermath. Complexity theory is not understood by regulators today, so perhaps LTCM partners can be forgiven for understanding complexity in 1988. Yet once the collapse occurred, it might be expected that thought leaders in finance like Alan Greenspan, Bob Rubin, and Larry Summers would have learned lessons, tried to avoid a similar collapse in the future. They did not. They did the opposite, he says. Hmm. Interesting. Glass Steagall was repealed by an unholy. Alliance of Republicans and Democrats led by Senator Phil Graham and, and President Bill Clinton. Reasons for repeal were not directly related to the LTCM crisis. They had been developing for years. Ratification of otherwise illegal merger of travel, travelers and Citicorp promoted. Sandy Well was a driving force for the elimination of Glass-Steagall. So, once again, that's not something new to reports of Glass-Steagall being implemented or re-implemented for Shock 2008. So we get into the new crisis. From the perspective of complexity theory, 2008 collapse was easily foreseen. The dynamically identical collapse happened in 1998. The scope of the 2008 panic was greater than in 1998. That increased scope was to be expected because systematic scale had increased in interver intervening 10 years. Our provisional law states derivatives risk increases exponentially as a function of scale measured by gross national value. Interesting. Now here we are getting into 2008 and how he foresaw that based upon prior complexity theory models and things like that. Some interviews here from CNBC's Jim Cramer. What else we got here? We can expect another panic spike in, 2000, in October 2008. Aftermath, the White House and Congress spent a year from 2009 to 2010 drafting and enacting the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act. It was signed into law by President Obama on July 21, 2010. Dodd-Frank was more than 1,000 pages long in its final form and was scarcely read by members of Congress who voted on it. Don Frank was an odd mix of gene reform, pseudo reform, dialectic, election, non essential matters from lobbyists with lists. FOSOC. FSOC is a new embodiment of the old president's working group. The Office of Financial Research is a new think tank set up inside Treasury to enable financial regulators to keep up Wall Street's whiz kids and derivatives risk management. In early 2013, I was invited to give a private briefing to FSOC and OFR officials in Treasury in Washington. And Ben, look on the play. Okay, yeah. Earthquake 2018. So here we are getting into the future. This is what lies ahead. It gives us two quotes here. It says, one, no single incident can really be uh, imagined to have brought about the end of the Bronze Age. Rather, the end must have come as a consequence of a complex series of events. 
that reverberated throughout the interconnected kingdoms and empires of the Aegean and Eastern Mediterranean that eventually led to a collapse of the entire system. This is from 1776 BC, the year civilization collapsed by Eric Decline. Then we have a quote here from Ian Morris. If the crowded, interconnected, urbanized, and nuclear armed world we have reached, created, uh, does stagger with a new dark age, it will surely be the most terrible of all, the dawn of new age. Man without a face. Not yet. Yep. Um, Fawcett's Fed. Fawcett is a Fed insider handpicked by Chairman Ben Bernanke in 2012. It is often used loosely to describe who's, who might be uh, involved in the inner circle of institutions that are properly inside. So he talks about a Foss insider in the, in the Fed that uh, gives a little information on that. Looking to find out more of his thoughts on this 2018. The power of gold. Simply seeing market collapse, even through complexity theory G lenses, is unsatisfying to investors who don't care why things end but want to know when. Greed plays a part. Investors may occur, concur that capital markets will crash, yet they're long, long for the ride until they do. In effect, investors say, I know stocks are a bubble but the gains are too good to resist. Call me the day before the crash. I'll sell, I'll sell everything, move to cash, buy gold, and keep my profits. Here's my number. The proper reply to the uh, penitent is not one with no the hour or day. It's not from maximum. Laboratory science, systematic instability. Systemic gold is the world's least understood asset class. Confusion arises because gold is traded like a commodity, yet gold is not a commodity, it is money. Countries with tens of thousands of tons of gold in their vaults are happy to obscure this distinction. Central banks know gold is money. They don't just want you to know. Still, the presence of 35,000 tons of gold in government's vaults, about 15% of all gold mined in history, testifies to go as my monetary role despite official denials. Even the IMF with official demonetized gold next to for a whole 2,800 tons. Switzerland's Bank for International Settlement is known as the Central Bank for Central Banks hold 108 tons for its own account. Central banks and finance ministers do not hold copper, aluminum, or steel supplies, yet they hold gold. Interesting. Scrolling on through, scrolling on through, we have the dollar shortage. This gold is not only money in short supply, there is a global dollar shortage also, and it grows worse by day. An acute phase of the dollar shortage will manifest soon as defaults, deflation, and bank failures. Answers that long, long with 3.3 trillion of new money created by the Fed, markets created more than 60 trillion of new debt and hundreds of trillions of dollars in new derivatives. The newly created money has been leveraged over 50 to 1 through various channels. Not all the new debt and derivatives constitute money as a term is conventionally defined. Still, debt represents a state in which a counterparty expects to receive her pay or money back by contractual performance in the full, full, uh, fullness of time. Interesting, 60 trillion of new debt. The most intriguing piece of evidence for a dollar shortage is a tangled trio of prices in five years. Uh, TIPS is gold and uh, 10-year treasury notes. TIP stands for Treasury Inflation Protective Securities. A special type of treasury note where the principal is indexed to inflation. This means the tips yield in a real yield. There is no need to add an inflation pre uh, premium to a nominal yield because principal is already protected against inflation. When an investor pays a premium over part to buy a tip, buy, buy a tips, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, the resulting uh, real yield to maturity is negative because the investor receives an inflation adjusted uh, principal minus the premium paid. From 2006 to 2013, gold and five-year tips measured by yield on an inverted scale exhibit a powerful positive correlation. This means, this makes sense. When bond yields are negative, gold is more attractive because gold has no yield. A greater negative yield on tips should correlate with a higher dollar price for gold, and it does. Hmm. Interesting. So on page 198, still scrolling through, earthquake 2018. 
Metaphors made of her earthquakes and avalanches are useful to convey the dynamics of financial collapses. Yet yeah, these dynamics are more than metaphors. The complex system dynamics and mathematical models used to describe both natural and financial disasters are substantially the same. And considering these system metaphors, allowance may be made for time scales. A currency collapse that moved in what seems slow motion was the fall of sterling and the rise of the dollar as a dominant global reserve currency. Ratification of the final act of Bretton Woods in, 2000, in 1945 is seen as a convenient date to mark the moment the dollar officially eclipsed the sterling. But the uh, currency eclipse took place 30 years earlier, in November 1914. So it goes back in time saying when it actually happened. Sterling's role from 1914 to 1944 was a cash, was a say the fact that London remained a financial center and Sterling remained a reserve currency had more to do with Britain's capital market in the British Empire. And do, 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 complexity and system breeds the seeds of the system's own collapse. Why did European civilization not experience a general collapse in thousands of years from the fall of Rome to the Renaissance? The answer is there was no Europe in a systemic sense. Interesting, the aftermath of the First World War that did not produce a stable system as occurred in 1946 to 1845. The Truth of Peace signed at Versailles on June 28, 1920. It was politically uh, pointed to punitive uh, defeat Germany. Yeah, so he goes into a big old history lesson here. Where are we now? Financial crises have supplanted kinetic warfare at the center of complex system dynamics. Financial crisis in 1998 and 2008 are analogs to Russian, Franco-German, and Balkan wars 1878-1912. They are warnings, tremors ahead of a misfortune beyond imagining. This is, an, this is not conjecture, but an expected outcome given the system dynamics. The outcome is not inevitable. Bonfire of the elites. Wildebeest and lionesses. Keynesians. Equilibrium is the holy grail of modern macro micro equilibrium. Models start with the simplest concept of supply and demand. Intersecting uh, curves apply to supply chain inputs an infinitive variety of finished products. Apple and the cat. Yeah, some of these uh, analogies here are quite interesting. Let me see, scroll through, scroll through, coming down to the end. Let me see what else is going on. This summary shows relatively we have empire of debt. The elite worldwide rests on the intellectual pillars of equilibrium models, monetarism, Keynesianism, floating exchange rates, free trade, globalization, and fiat money. Meanwhile, the world, real world is best understood through the lens of complexity theory, conditional probability, behavioral psychology, currency wars, neo-mercantilism, and gold. Cognitive dissonance between the elite worldwide and real world economics is taking its toll on elite self-confidence and control. 1970s were a transitional period for the post-war Bretton Woods institutions. Gold was abandoned as a monetary standard. Floating exchange rates emerged in the mid-1970s. Still, the demise of the gold standard was muted by the rise of the new dollar standard during the Reagan administration. King dollar was, fin was uh, financed by Treasury Secretary James Baker through the Plaza Accord in 1985 and LaRue Accord in 1987, which yielded broad agreement among major economies on acceptable exchange rates. King dollar was not a fixed rate reg regime. But it was the next best thing, bolstered by Paul Volcker's success uh, at achieving low inflation after the near hyperinflationary episode of 1971, 77 to 81. Da, 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 da. Beneath the surface, not rot set in. Corruption was institutionalized in Russia and China. Income inequality soared, and the low hanging fruit of the factory utilization in emerging markets was quickly gone. He said a standard gauge of debt, substantially in the debt to GDP rate, to GDP ratio. From 2000 to 2013, global debt to GDP ratio, including financial firms, rose from 163 to 212%. In the same period, the developing economy debt to GDP ratio rose from 310% to 385%. These trends show no pause or deleveraging as a result of the 2008 financial crisis, while private debt levels declined somewhat after 2008. Growth in government debt more than made up the difference and kept total debt elevated. Too much debt. Too much debt. Jet, debt, debt to GDP ratio soaring. Cold de sac. 
chapter three, capitalism, fascism, democracy. Uh, da, 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 da. We got some quotes here. Capitalism, democracy, never. Uh, Joseph, um, John Peters, the uh, name conjures the phrase creative destruction, his best known intellectual contribution, one of the most powerful economic insights of the finance, uh, 20th century with important implications today. Schumpeter wrote a critical juncture between the end of the Great Depression and the start of the Second World War. Capitalism was on trial and socialism was on, was in vogue, including the United States, where it had failed to take root during previous socialist cycles in the late 19th and earlier 20th centuries. Franklin D. Roosevelt administration in 1933 to 45 was filled with socialist reformers and endeavors from massive Tennessee Valley authority power project. Yeah. All right, scrolling thought here, coming towards the end. The new Praetorians. In ancient Rome, the Praetorian Guard were an elite military unit that provided personal protection of emperors. The era, their evolution is a cautionary tale. Praetorians originally guarded the commander's dwelling while on campaign. The name Praetorian is derived from Praetor, a Roman general. His tent was called the Praetorium. In the late Republican Republic, Julius Caesar used such a guard. Over time, the Praetorium Guard grew larger. It included the best and equipped most elite troops, handpicked by the commander. Caesar entered Rome with his personal guard in January 14 BC, 49 BC. The act of insurrection left led swiftly to civil war. Caesar's assassination, the fall of Roman Empire, and the emergence of Roman Empire under Augustus. So a little history lesson building up into something. Divide a lot of quotes here from different authors and little um, injection of their works into explaining his point. The new fascism, fascism is not a, it's not in our future. It is here now. Fascism, a dominant force in the 20th century, remains one of the least understood and most ill-defined political isms. This is because fascism is not ideological, like communism or socialism. Fascists are uh, expose certain views at various times, yet their views are inconsistent and often quickly discarded. What matters to fascists is continuous action and, and state control of civic life. The fascist state may allow pr uh, private corporations and associations to exist, provided they operate in accordance with the state goals and submit to state surveillance. Deviation from state goals results in termination or incapitation of private deviance. Wow. Wilson's book, The State Aids Government Governments, does not, does know whatever experience permits or times demand. Yeah. Money nexus. Fascists thrive on action and never let a crisis go to the waste. Among these best crises to advance a fascist agenda are war and financial panic. The 9-11 attacks produced the Patriot Act, which opened the door to massive surveillance of American citizens without probable cause. The 2008 financial crashes produced Dodd-Frank, which institutionalized the role of six mega banks: J.P. Morgan, Citibank, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, uh, Morgan Stanley, and Goldman Sachs. American savings and investments were herded into these portals where they are controlled by government. A few more mega asset aggregators, MetLife, Prudential, and BlackRock are also in the government's crosshairs. The fact that their clients' wealth is digital makes confiscation, uh, confiscation and controls for reasons of state even easier. The next financial crisis will not be merely a bigger version of 1998, 1998, and 2008. It will be quantitatively different. It will encompass multiple asset classes on a global scale. It will exhibit inflation not seen since the 1970s, insolvency not seen since the 1930s, exchange shutdowns not seen since 1914. State power will be summed, summoned to contain panic. Liquidity will come from the IMF as directed by the G20, including a large voice of China. Capitalism will be discredited once and for all. Interesting. Not a good picture. Chapter 9, Behold a Black Horse. Here we go in regards to that quote from the very beginning, the countdown clock. Complexity theory says we will not know the time of the financial 
uh, collapse in advance. The conclusion is not a case of throwing up one's hands and half uh, knowledge. It is the best science we have mixed with a dose of humility. Complex systems in a critical state are fragile, constructs with countless points of failure, catalyzed by immeasurable small causes. That dynamic makes systemic failure certain. Experiments show that as complex systems grow in scale, the size of the worst possible event expands exponentially. The frequency of small-scale adverse events also increases. We simply cannot know when exactly when events will occur. Indistinctively, and timing is not a, a failure of theory. It is the heart of the theory. The United States Geographical Survey defies four shocks and earthquakes that uh, precede large earthquakes in the same location. Of course, large is a relative term. If the stored energy financial stability was not released, the energy is still there. Policy intervention in 1998 and 2008 combined with added complexity in the time since means financial energy awaiting release may be 10 megawatts, whatever it's called. So we're basically saying that, you know, but if, because they put off things so long, it only makes it a lot worse when the next one does happen. Interesting, 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 interesting. Coming down towards the end here. Incoherence. Yeah, so this is pretty much a big uh, conclusion. Here we are towards the end of the book. On February 11, 2015, Billy Cold Evening, I took a part in a formal debate before a live audience in the theater just off Broadway in Manhattan's Upper West Side. The debate proposition was a loaded gun. Da -da 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 -da. Boy, the audience boiled it on proposition, created argue Americans. Yeah, more talk. So, anyway. We are at the end. Acknowledgement. So, this is uh, the rundown on the road to ruin. So here we have the notes, just some things here going on, all the research. And as he loves to point out, he, you know, if you don't give his sources, then it can't really, you know, take his word for it. So he gives more than enough sources to kind of back up what he's talking about here. So anyway, the road to ruin. The global elite secret plan for the next financial crisis. So this is the rundown of the book. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Let me know your thoughts below. Thanks.